We'll get to the other text in a minute. Last week I wanted to show this. I found it a little late for Memorial Day. Your day at the beach brought to you by their day at the beach. It just sticks in my head all the time as we start summer. Uh, freedom. I really could have switched last week's sermon and this week's sermon because uh, today we're really all about freedom and especially uh, freedom in Christ and it's something that our even secular culture knows something about as we begin summer. Um, last week I preached on Ascension because we were close to Ascension Day and in Ascension we talked about Jesus going up this great metaphor of levity and lightness that can be for us a kind of a symbol of how to live our own lives complete with the challenges uh, that we sometimes prefer a heaviness sometimes we prefer uh, to ignore the joy and grace um, these are difficult days for any church anywhere there's so much talk about selling buildings churches folding congregations disbanding congregations having to be especially adept at how to be a congregation so they can be flexible enough to even survive let alone thrive uh, that's where we are not just as presbyterians but as almost anyone inside a church building these days so we are tempted also uh, to feel a heaviness with our problems when there's so few solutions around um, i don't know anyone who's got satisfactory solutions if i did we'd be we wouldn't be in the situation yet today um, a certain levity. We'll finish with Roar in a minute uh, after worship today. He especially talks about in the second half of life, there's a way of taking yourself less seriously, uh, less heavy, and that for spiritually oddly grounded people, falling upward uh, is the challenge. We know that ego doesn't matter. We know that things we've been so enamored of, so uh, fantastically passionate about, in fact, are often just our own ego exercises and when we let go of that uh, we find a certain ease um, today we'll finish that in our conversation it's a great last couple chapters we do that especially by tapping into God's joy uh, which is another way of taking ourselves I suppose less seriously uh, next week we're red next week we'll talk about a little more prayerful and intrapersonal uh, how we access that kind of power uh, what the Spirit will do for us in terms of uh, growing in faith, uh, ascending, being truly free. So here's this wonderful section that Marty read out of the very last part of the book. The whole conclusion of the story is what you heard this morning just in those uh, few verses. And it's very hopeful uh, and upbeat. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z. And then Marty, when you read these verses, did you say that's my kind of people? I, I was back getting my stuff on. I didn't. Oh, that's perfect. If you look, you should look right now at this chapter. Because the lectionary omits verse 15 and omits 18 through 19. The lectionary says, Here, Pastor Don, later just Marty, read these wonderful verses about concluding. Could you leave out the part about the fornicators and the lecherous and the awful who aren't going to get to bathe their robes in the glory? I mean, it's just, it's, if you look at those verses, you'll see. Ah, I get it. Someone thought, you know what, this will be a much more upbeat Sunday morning if we just take these verses out. So does the electionary want to provide us with hope for the end, but also there's a nervousness always about judgment, um, about hard news. And you wouldn't be alone for thinking like the electionary team, maybe we'd be better off not doing this. Uh, I had someone come to me this week and say this, isn't it true? that because we love Jesus, we're not supposed to judge others? I said, that's absolutely not true. <laughs> that is the first step. That is elementary Christianity. Love others, don't judge others. But of course, Jesus is profoundly judging. He judges others all the time. Of course, justice demands that we judge your spouse, your kids, your pastor, your community. Justice, compassion, deep love insists that we judge. It's the American version of, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we all just got along? It, wouldn't it be nice if we just didn't care what we believed and just left everyone alone? Left on, it, it, just leave me alone with my phone is the American ideal. We require something else. Um, and here it is. Uh, that in fact, from the start, we've had this uncomfortable relationship between law 
and grace of God loving us wholly, but loving us too much to leave us the way we are. So God having really high expectations of us. And uh, deep people, faithful followers, know about that tension in their own lives, in their own marriages, and parenting, and grandparenting, and know that the word of God is sometimes difficult to hear. It's a paradox. All right, turn to Acts. Here's, on this day of freedom, one of the best stories about freedom. We're in the New Testament, right after the Gospels. Acts 16. On page 136. It's called Paul and Silas in prison. This is the lectionary text that they've paired with Revelation. Sometimes we see the logic of why they're putting stories together, not always, but in this freedom and in this uh, umbrella of God controls everything at the end of Revelation. Uh, here's we have the story that you might remember. It's called Paul and Silas uh, in prison. Uh, Acts 16, 16 through 34. It goes like this. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. <laughs> what a complex line that is. She's got a spirit and what she can predict the future. She's fortune telling and someone's making a lot of money. Lest you think that the challenges facing American religion are new. <laughs> uh, there we've got right here. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves a great word, of the Most High God who proclaimed to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. So he casts out uh, the Spirit, and it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, <laughs> they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in their stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword was about to kill himself since he was supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we're all right here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do uh, to be saved? And he answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your whole household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced. He'd become a believer in God. There ends our second lesson. What a great story of captivity and freedom, of self-interested religion invested in money, in things rather than people, and how upset they got at Paul and Silas. Uh, you really shouldn't mess with people's source of income, apparently. And then what I love about this freeing story is it's in worship. They're not just complaining about the food. They're not just wishing they were elsewhere. It's uh, when they're worshiping together that not only they, but the whole jail is suddenly freed, doors spring open, chains fall off. I think in worship, is how we become free because we get out of ourselves. It's the only time of a week when we're not the final arbiter of what is, what we're consuming, what we're watching, what we're buying. Uh, we're not in control of the conversation. Hopefully we're opening up a conversation that is with God and the Spirit as well. 
So it's got an open-ended quality to it. That is what can bring us uh, freedom. And I'm wondering this morning, this revolutionary thing we all do, worshiping regularly, how it might free others. Do you ever tell people you spend time in worship? Because as soon as you even use that word, you put yourself in a different category for your next door neighbor, your work associate, your person in the store, your friend of a friend that you thought you knew and recognized. Once worship comes up, you put yourself in a new category of someone who is freer or more of a slave. Yes, both, right? In the story, there's, we're slaves of Jesus Christ because we believe that's the only way we can truly be free. There's a synopsis uh, of the story. Everyone's chains uh, get undone. What I want to finish with is how to stay free. Um, like I said, our country has an understanding of this. People, what makes your country extraordinary? Someone would probably say, we believe in freedom, unlike those awful Canadians who prefer slavery. Um, it's always been our big thing, right? Freedom. Uh, often we've translated that mostly into meaning no one's the boss of me. I can do whatever I want all the time. I don't have to listen to anybody else. And not quite what the founding fathers were after, uh, but there it is for our independence. Um, we hang crosses around our neck. We put them at the front of the sanctuary to say we're not free. We believe something else. We believe in lordship, which is significantly about not free. We believe that if you follow Jesus Christ, you are somehow held captive, restrained. And what's restrained is, of course, your ego. What's restrained is, of course, your selfishness, so that you could truly be human and freed. It's a deeper kind of freedom. That's why we keep the torture instruments at the front of our sanctuary to say, this is difficult. It's difficult to be human and free. And we're not there. That's why we need the Lord in our lives. That our own egos are the taskmasters, the slave masters that we need freeing from. And in Christ Jesus, we do that. I want to take a little uh, side note here about existential philosophy. When I say the word existential, you feel a little guilty and ashamed because you think, uh, that's not really Christian, is it? And here's the reason why, and it belongs in this conversation about freedom. The 50s, 60s, when existentialism was coming out of France and into our culture, one of the sharpest things that Jean-Paul Sartre said uh, was about bad faith. Uh, and so we think, oh, those existentialists think faith is bad. No, that, that's not what it means at all. The term bad faith has to do with how uncomfortable freedom makes us. All right? We significantly don't want to be free. We prefer law to grace. We significantly would have other people tell us what to do. The existentialist complaint about religion was this. Uh, not about Christianity, not about Jesus, not about miracles, resurrection, lordship, any of that. The complaint was this. Too often, Christian faith, positing a God, an angry old man in heaven who's telling us what to do, I better do this so I don't go to hell. They call that bad faith. Because it's you looking for a source outside of yourself to tell you what to do. The line from existentialism is, uh, we are condemned to be free. What Sarch and Camus wanted to point out was, we are radically free. We are free to choose, and that's what makes it difficult. It's not like you think where a book always tells you what to do. That's bad faith. Grow up. They wanted to say, you better read critically and understand what you're doing. And you can find evidence in the Bible, both yea and nay. Follow the Lord Jesus. Make sure you understand your role in this. It's not, it's not being loving or good when you're just being an eight-year-old doing what your mother and father said. And that's, no, that's not maturity or even religion. All right? Bad faith, and we have a lot of it in our country, right? Bad faith is when we look to someone else for doing what only we can do. We are condemned to be free. We can make choices about our relationships, our belief, our behavior. We can choose to be loving. As long as we're only loving because we're afraid of something, uh, that's not really loving. Five-year-olds make that decision all the time. I won't steal the cookie. I'll get spanked. 
And that's not morality. That's blind obedience. And that's what the existentialist said we have to move beyond. I sometimes think of myself as an existentialist Christian because I'm preoccupied with meaning. And rather than spending lots of time talking about heaven and hell, there's not much of that in scripture, I spend much more time talking about meaning in life. When I'm thinking, talking about salvation, healing, wholeness, often what I'm thinking about is how can we find meaning in this life? And that's an existential reading of our tradition, scripture, Jesus' teachings, that what you and I need, I don't know about heaven and hell. I have hopes. I don't believe in hell at all. I have hopes for heaven. Yes, it shapes my life. I want to follow the Lord Jesus, but I understand I'm totally, I understand God can't make me do a thing. Jesus wants lots for me and is utterly reliant upon me deciding to be an adult and choosing every day to be loving, to do the difficult thing. That's the challenge of being an adult disciple. That the freedom scares me. I'd rather politics was easier. I'd rather my life was easier. I would like having an authority to tell me what to do, what to believe. That's bad faith because what that takes out is my decisiveness. Freedom is the big umbrella where that conversation belongs. Freedom to be a slave for Christ, freedom to follow Christ is our path, and it's scary. It's scary to let go of ego, to crucify ego. It's scary to say I want to follow Jesus even though it's hard, and I know that no one can make me, and I know I won't be popular or successful because of it. If we're just acting, I know if I do this, then I'll get in heaven, and that's pretty reductive thinking. It's a lot of superstition in Christianity that takes the adult out of discipleship. Um, a deeper freedom is what we're after. That's why Jesus in his teachings sometimes upsets us because what he says seems to almost go against what we know about religion. And that's why some of your most spiritual friends seem oddly flaky. As Rohr says, they've got a foot in another camp as well. We know this from our mountain metaphor and the Sherpa. That the deepest spiritual ones know the limitations of institutional religion and Genesis and Presbyterian and, and all this stuff. And they're both with us and they know their allegiance is somewhere else as well. And that's scary for us to hear. We'd rather tell them, don't you know, since you're a member of Genesis, you have to do this? It's don't. If you're on nominating committee, don't you know you've been a member, you have to do this? No, Jesus wants more freedom for us. A freedom to choose and a freedom even to let other people do what they're going to do without manipulation. That, it's really hard. In the church, we prefer to go to guilt and shame. It's your turn to serve. You better give in this way. Don't you know this is the way we've always done it? It's not the way Jesus ever did it. Um, they didn't like Paul because it cost him a lot in the pocketbook and because his slavish devotion to Jesus Christ undid their religion. And we should be the same way in our conversations and our relationships and our loving chats across the table. They should pick up on us an appreciation of freedom deeper than obligation. A freedom following Jesus is deeper than what any institution expects or wants. A freedom that costs ego, but is willing to explore what discipleship might really mean. Devoid of the superficial oughts, superficial expectations of tradition, maintenance, properness. Following Christ wherever it leads, because that's our truest and deepest and only real freedom. Amen.